Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that won't nick or snag your nuts. So go to manscaped.com and use code Holly to get 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have a very special guest, somebody who I actually haven't seen in quite a while, but I have shot many photos of her in the past. And so I am thrilled to bring to you the one and only Kimberly Kane. Hi, Kimberly. How are you? Hi, Holly. Doing well. Good. <laughs> as well as we can be right now. <laughs> I know, right? It's uh, It's been a weird year. Now, this is going to come out in January of actually 2021, but we're recording this, um, what's today, December 17th, uh, so right before yes. Christmas in this epic year of 2020. Uh, how has this year been for you? Kimberly, has it been one of like it's been hardship, reflection? Um yeah, what's it been? What's it been like? It's been it, um work wise, it's been good um because of OnlyFans. Honestly, work wise it's been good. I've been able to keep my assistant on and make money and I'm gonna be buying a house soon and that. Um, emotionally, um, and with sickness in my family and death. And I mean, I, I lost my dog and my dad this year. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. One of our dogs. Yeah. So it's been really shitty, really, really shitty, Wow. but, um, I would say I'm one of the lucky ones. I think that that's really great that you can have suffered loss like that and be able to consider yourself lucky. Why do you consider yourself lucky? Cause I'm still alive and I am and I'm able to keep my assistant at home working and I can work at home and, um, sex work provides. It really does. It's kind of been the year of the sex worker. I mean, we've seen so many people who are out of a job kind of jump on this sex work only fans bandwagon. Yep. What do you think about that? There's been a lot of controversy around whether or not people are really getting into sex work and and thinking about it and thinking about the repercussions that it often carries with it. I didn't think about it when I got into the business. I needed money. And then through the industry and being in the industry, um, I thought to myself, oh, wow, this is a really good job. I need to keep this job. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, people are struggling. And, you know, at, when I got in, you know, it was dancing and then, you know, um, and then getting into adult, but now, you do not have to leave your house and there are plenty of resources to teach new people. And I actually do a lot of, um, outreach with, um, girls. Like if I see someone online and they're struggling, you know, I will reach out to them and I will train them on OnlyFans, and I will do a shout for shout with them and I will push traffic towards them. You know what I mean? Like, like, we do help each other out, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, um, sex work provides and people are starting to realize that. And I think that's also the reason why, you know, you see an uptick in performers, um, and then you see an uptick in, uh, like Exodus cry and wanting to take down Pornhub and like this and that. Um, it is, I think, a, a, I think the more people get in sex work, the more people hate on said people for trying to survive. Um, I was just watching the news because I watched too much. 
uh, news lately. And they broke it down between the $1,200 stimulus that we got and the $600 that may be coming to people um, over the course of the time between the time we got that first stimulus and when we get this one, it'll be $50 a month. The wow. government has offered, or wait, or $50 a week. I'm not sure. It's awful. <laughs> you know, so uh, people are struggling and sex work will help them and you don't have to leave your house. Now, I think that after all of this and once people have used sex work as a platform to make money, hopefully it changes people's minds. You know, hopefully there'll be a lot more people that that will be able to say, I survived 2020 because I had this avenue. I yeah. lost my job. I, I was able to feed my kids, you know? It's been really interesting to see. I mean, you and I have been in the industry for a long time, right? How long has it been for you? 2003. Yeah. So I think I was... 1999 or something like that. So it's been 22 years for me. Um, and boy, have we seen a lot of change. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we can agree that, that porn though, far from actually being widely accepted is becoming more normalized. Um, I actually just the other day, um, AOC tweeted that sex work is work. I mean, to have a prominent yep, politician saw that. say that to me was just like, wow, yeah. this is incredible. So what do you think are, yeah. what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the industry? And it can be for good or for bad or maybe one of each. So <laughs> I'll start with the bad first. I think it's so <laughs> funny. Um, it, it, it's a joke bad um, that male performers now look like they're underage, you know, <laughs> and they're not, they're not studs. They're like these scrawny boys because it's all step mommy stuff. They're yeah. It's stuff. really so interesting how that yeah. dynamic has shifted. Normally it was like what you wanted was these really young, like teenage looking girls and older men. And now it's like, yeah. MILFs are doing really well and then like really young looking boys. But you see yeah. a less outcry around that. Have you noticed that than you did with girls yeah. looking underage because yeah. the whole like victimhood yeah. idea with women and men are, you know, can handle themselves, women can't kind of thing. I think that the whole boy thing is um you know, of course, it's a generation of American pie, right? The stepmom, mm. Stifler's mom thing. Right. And then you're, and then they're born and raised on that thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that nowadays, um, younger guys are softer and they, they want to be pursued and they're, they're scared to pursue a woman. Probably, you know, they don't know how to do it in a way that maybe is appropriate or they don't want to get in trouble or they don't want to say the wrong thing or they don't want to offend. And so they become more meek. And so for the older woman, which is my bread and butter right now, I, I have so many like mommy, dommy slaves now. Um, they want to be told what to do. They want to know that it's okay to x y and z they you know what i mean like so i think it's just a a, a dynamic um that is cultural uh honestly yeah yeah and it's it's nice i think maybe that we're taking some pressure off of men to always be the ones in charge and always be the dominant ones mm -hmm. and always be the you know, people who, um, why am I, I lost the word insight is not the word I'm looking for. What's, what's the word when you try to start oh, something? When they, oh, uh, you know, like, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, 
Oh, I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I just completely, you know, like when you, yeah. you, you have a word on the tip of your Approach tongue and you use it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, and, and then you, the more you try to think about it, the more it's gone. Anyways, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I think it's a cultural dynamic. Um, and yeah, I think, I think, I think our young men are a little softer nowadays <laughs> than the, the Rocco Sofredis of the world, you know? Right. <laughs> right and that's okay with me yeah and and how and how wonderful it is too that there's this whole new niche for older women because I remember back in the day you know when I was working for my mom for Suzanette if a woman walked in and she was in her 30s forget it you know like you were not getting any work and now that's one of the most popular search terms is MILF Like to be an older, mature woman is these women are incredibly popular. And even though I'm not a performer, it makes me feel better about myself because I am now the age of those milk performers. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's nice. It's, uh, it's, well, it's also happening in mainstream too. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, it's just this cultural shift where older women, I mean, like Jessica Lange, one of the greatest actresses of all time, you know, heading American Horror Story, you know, season after season after season, um, you know, um, so many older women now exist in the leading roles. Mm-hmm. It's a good, it's good. It's yeah. great. Older women are babes and we know what we're doing. Yes. And we will, we will teach you young thing. <laughs> <laughs> we will teach you the ways. <laughs> I personally love shooting MILFs because you guys are always on time. Mm -hmm. You read the call sheet, Mm -hmm. you brought the wardrobe, you memorized your lines, and we both have the same taste in music. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I prefer, I, I call myself a like digital dom or a dommy, dommy mommy. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't go for MILF because I, I don't, I guess I should, because I also am very mothering with my domination. It's, um, Mm -hmm. it can be a sense. It's, it's a strict, strict mommy, sensual experience. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. (laughs) right. Yeah. So I guess I, I could go MILF, but I usually like stray away from MILF. I'm like, dummy, mommy, you know? So it's, it's more catchy. It rolls off the tongue better. Yeah. It's it's fun. Yeah. It's so overused. It is. Yeah. What's the next thing? Yeah. Right. Okay. So that was the bad change about the industry. We went off on quite a tangent with that. What are, what is one of the best things that you've seen change in the last 20 years? The fact that, um, you can, okay. So when I first started, um, it was all based on being hired uh, to do a scene for a company. And there was multiple tons of companies shooting tons of content and, you know, and big features and like this and that. Right. And that's what you survived off of. And now, um, girls can become really, really popular on clip stores and only fans and they can choose to go into adult to amplify their name or not. You, you have more choices on which way you want to go with your career. Um, in 2012, I painfully started trying to switch over to shooting my own content and mm-hmm. working the clip stores. And there wasn't even really stores. There was just like clips for sale, you know, it's so hard to use. I don't know what was up with that interface. I tried that too. And I well, I work it out. I am a clips for sale wizard. So if you need any help, let me know. Um, <laughs> I'm a wizard in all of the, all of the clip sites and all of this thing. So, um, I think that's the coolest thing is that you don't have to live in LA anymore. You don't have to go to the go sees if you don't want, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Right. You know, or compromise any, you know, you don't have to compromise rates. You don't have to, you, you can work from home. 
And I think that is a lifesaver right now. And a lot of, and honestly, a lot of the cam girls, they'll tell you, they'll be like, they're like, I'm awkward. You know, like, I just like to be in my little cam nook and, you know, totally. like they, they wouldn't be able to feel comfortable on a set. You know, they want to just do everything, you know, the way they want to do it. And, and options are the best thing that I think has happened in the adult industry. So many options. Yeah. I mean, really giving the performers power to choose their own path and not be, you know, uh, pushed into doing something that they don't want to do. Though, obviously that still happens, but. uh, Or pigeonholed into, you know, a, a certain category or certain, you know, this and that. And I love how like the black performers are fucking like taking, you know, like they got fucked over forever, Mm -hmm. forever. Like why wasn't Prince Yashua performer of the year? Why wasn't, I mean, you can go down the list of why weren't these people who are the best, why aren't they in these categories? Why are just because of the color of their skin, they're a niche that's bullshit. And that is starting to change or hopefully, I don't know, I'm not on set in LA anymore, but hopefully that's changing. All right, guys, we are going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how Kimberly got into the adult industry. We're going to talk about how she was one of the founding members of APAC and so much more. So don't go away. We will be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Do you or your partner desire a pair of smooth hairless balls, but you don't want to bring a razor down there because you don't want to damage your crown jewels in any way? This is where Manscaped comes to the rescue. Their electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0, has proprietary skin safe technology that will not nick or snag your nuts, guaranteed. And plus they have so many other products to offer. They have stuff like their crop reviver and their crop preserver, which helps your balls not only smell amazing, but also prevents them from chafing, sticking, or sweating. So if you or somebody in your life wants to up your genital game and you don't want to use the same trimmer that you use on your face down there, Make sure that you go to manscaped.com, use code HOLLY, and get 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HOLLY for 20% off plus free shipping. Okay, so we're back. So Kimberly, I'm going to ask you the question that I ask almost everybody on this show, but everybody's story is different, and usually it's a very interesting Mm -hmm. one. How did you get into the adult industry? (laughs) Okay. So I was, um, 19 or yes, I was 19 and I was somehow ended up in Rancho Cucamonga. (laughs) Um, I helped a friend move down there and I, you know, was just like a little scumbag. And so I was just like hanging out and dancing and like just being a piece of shit. And, um, and she had done some scenes, uh, and, uh, and she needed to go to LA to pick up a check from a director or something. So, I mean, this, I knew nothing. Like I literally, like we were driving and I thought like some small city on the way to LA was LA. Like, I was like, is that it? You know, like, it's like, you know, I, Santa Clarita, I, or what, I, I have no idea. Where were you, where are you from? I'm from the Pacific Northwest. Okay. So I was living in Portland before I came down to Rancho Cucamonga. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we go to the Canaan house to pick up a check for her. And it was Pat Mine uh, was directing scenes, you know? And I went over to, uh, you know, the area where they were shooting a sex scene and this, uh, this performer, I used to remember her name, maybe in like old interviews, (laughs) I can dig it up, but she's like reverse cowgirl 
on the stairs at the Canaan house, you know, working. And she started fucking with me, you know, she was like, Hey, you know, you're gonna watch me. You're gonna have to take off your shirt. And I was like, okay, you know, because she's fucking. So I thought maybe that's, that's what you think that was like normal protocol. Like, yeah, everyone's gonna be like, shirtless. yeah, like maybe I'm a stranger. Maybe she needs me to take off my shirt to make her feel more comfortable. So I did. And so Pat mine slithers up, you know, <laughs> and asked me if I would ever do a scene. And, you know, honestly, the vibe of the, the vibe of the set and all the people that were there and everything that was happening, the buzz of being there, it felt good, you know, and, um, I said yes, because they were kind of like my people, you know, like I, you know, my, I'm second generation sex worker. I grew up around very strong, powerful, in my opinion, like sex workers. So being on that set reminded me of my people. And so I said, yes. And then, uh, (laughs) I was such a scumbag. So he tells me you got to go and get tested, you know, and then you come back here and, you know, we shoot the scene and I'll get you a really hot guy. <laughs> he said, you know, yeah. and he got me like Julian. Do you remember Julian? Oh, of course I remember Julian. Yeah. Yeah. He was hot. Yeah. He was really hot and he was mean. Um, he was like, he, he was, kind yeah, of he, could be, he could be a little cold. He was, yeah. yeah like he didn't, Anyway, so I'll get to the scene, but, um, so I go and get tested and I had chlamydia. I came, yeah, I was such a piece of shit. So I had to wait, take the meds, get tested again, then go and do my scene with Julian, who was like angry at me the whole time because I didn't know sex positions, Mm, you know? Yeah. Um, but it was great. And so then, um, I came back to to Portland and this like, you know, pimpy agent who uh, was the agent of DK. Do you remember DK, the agent DK? No, God, there's so many back in the day. Yeah. So he um, was my friend's agent for a minute. She, she did a couple scenes and was out, but um, he kept calling me. People want to hire you sending your photos around. People want to see you. People want to meet you. And, and I, you know, I guess the rest is history. Wow. So I want to just quickly scoop back to what you said earlier. You said you were a second generation sex worker. Could you expand on that? Yeah. Um, my mother, um, was a dancer, a, um, a, softcore erotic film producer mm-hmm. um she it was very old school um in her sex work practices it wouldn't fly nowadays um and so for me i felt that she taught me everything to not do mm. you know like dirty hustling. She was a dirty hustler. <laughs> she was a dirty fucking hustler, old school, you know? <laughs> um, and so I, you know, yes, second generation. <laughs> so I guess then you didn't really struggle too much with like telling your family about what you were doing. Cause I know that that's oh, often yeah. a real oh, sticking yeah, point. She, yeah. uh, she was not happy. Um, you know, she wasn't happy. Um, and I didn't really care because I was 19. Um, and But my other side of the family through the years figured it out and they love me unconditionally. And, you know, I, I have no family. My family's not religious. I think religion has a lot of, a lot to do with when people are like, can't handle it. Mm-hmm. It's re- and my family's not religious. So we're good. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, is, but my mom and I do not have a relationship. 
Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I want to ask you next about APAC. Yeah. I believe you're one of the founding members of APAC. And for those of you who don't know what APAC is, it's the Adult Performer Advocacy Committee. So could you explain that a little bit more and how did, what motivated you to start that and how did the whole thing begin? I was asked to join. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a group of, the original group of performers and they felt that my voice was important. I didn't see it. I was actually hesitant to join. Um, but in the end I did. And, um, and I think that the theory of the committee is sound and it's needed and it's good. It's, you know, I wish that bigger names were involved. I wish Mm -hmm. that more people showed up. I wish that more people felt that this is a community you know? Um, and that was always such a bummer was, you know, the same people would come every week and eat, no matter how much outreach we did, no matter how much charity stuff we did or AIDS walks or this and that, just the same 20 people would show up. And it always irked me that more people didn't put in the time to give a shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's changed hands many a times since then. Um, I, I think it's very important, but, um, I think there's still a lot of stuff to work out with it. You know, um, outreach is so important and, um, they try. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's always been a struggle to get people to organize, I think. And I don't know, I feel like, I think it's changed a lot more now, but I feel like historically, a lot of times adult has kind of been very much like individuals, like it hasn't necessarily felt like a collective, you know, like people coming together. I think that that's changed now. I see a lot more of that now, but I think back in the day, it was definitely kind of more like, you know, I'm going to get mine and... Mm -hmm the rest of you can just figure it out and go fuck yourself. Yeah. Or that's my competition or who's, who's going to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I just, um, yeah, but yeah, you can, you can either care about it and be in the industry for 20 plus years, 30 plus years. I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. A lot of people aren't like that. A lot of people, Mm -hmm will pop in and pop out Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay too. I want to ask you next about, um, your hosting gig for, um, the munchies sex and food show for Viceland, um, a show that explores food fetishes, food domination and food Uh products related to sex, food, porn, Actually, that's not even the right term. Like food porn is generally like food, pictures of food that looks really good that like makes people horny, whatever. It's like some weird internet meme thing. Feeder, feedy, splosh. Okay. See, feeder and feedy I know from having Carla Lane on. She explained that to me. Splosh I've not heard. So yeah, so basically food fetish is something that we've really never explored on this show. And um, now that I'm talking to you about this, I can't believe we've never covered this. So maybe you could educate us a bit more. Okay. Okay. So um, feeder feedy is um, someone who get, like gets pleasure from caring for and, and feeding someone and then the feedy is the person being fed and it is a ritual and um it, it can be sexual or, or it can't be it's a way of show some people show their love through food and then of course horny people it becomes a fetish right mm-hmm. and um And I actually interviewed a feeder feedy couple um in that I mean like she would literally like 
she, I mean, I, I actually did some of these scenes with her where she like, um, beer bonged like milkshakes and stuff like you know it, it was crazy you should eat like wow. ch- cheese during sex which I, i'm into that <laughs> i would totally eat cheese during sex uh, um and then splosh so i you know cake sitting this and that you know i never really understood it as you know it was kind of like oh today on jim lane set we're covering so and so in food mm-hmm. okay very transactional i didn't get it but i did a scene with a food dominatrix um on viceland on the munchie show and she like i subbed to her for a, a, like a mini session on camera and she uses food um like she cracked eggs on my chest like i'm blindfolded she cracks eggs on my chest and moves them around so it created like these little tiny like cuts you know like little you know not like you could really see them but she moved these cracked these eggs and moved them around smashed them Mm -hmm. on my chest right then she took hot sauce and put the hot sauce on my chest. And then to, I, need, I had to call Mercy and then she poured milk on my chest to make, to, to alleviate the pain of the hot sauce. You know, so she, that's how she used splash. She used like, um, like a tool in her tool chest of domination. Yeah. yeah. It was really so- fascinating and very hot. Wow. So it was the eggshells that mm-hmm. kind of created this, like, like it kind of irritated your skin or created yeah. small cuts, like you said. And then, so when she pours the hot sauce on you, you really feel that. How long did you last for? I lasted longer than I wanted to because I hadn't subbed in so long that I forgot to call Mercy. And so I'm in my head and I'm like, whoa, wow. Ah, you know? And then I was like, <laughs> oh, wait. Like, safe word, you know, like whatever it was red. And then she was like, you know, with the milk. And I'm like, Oh my God, I could have ended that like a minute ago. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. That is so so That's interesting because when you said food dominatrix, I thought for sure it was somebody who would like force you to eat food, you know, like quote unquote force you to eat food and, you know, call you a little pig or something like that while she's shoving like hot dogs down your throat. But it wasn't that at all. There's that too. I, there's also, um, uh, Aiden star does, was doing a diet, um, food domination where she Mm. actually had a, uh, I believe this years ago, um, an overweight, uh, client, and she would make them do certain amount of exercises and certain amount of this and that. There's, there's so many ways to. I just do- called a personal trainer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 think I feel like it's torture. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like fun. the only difference is at the end, you're either locked in chastity or you get to come. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a better motivation. Maybe this is like a whole new exercise routine that just hasn't been explored by the general public and needs to, this could be like the next South beach diet. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It'd be like the dungeon diet, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. That is so great. Wow. I love it. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we are going to talk about Kimberly's time working at the bunny ranch. So hang tight. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. 
And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. We are back. So Kimberly, you are a brothel worker or so, not at the moment, but you were working at the Bunny Ranch um, up until the pandemic. And this is something that is always so fascinating for my audience. And and honestly, some of my favorite interviews have been with people who openly talk about working in brothels and they talk about it in such an intelligent way, um, you know, really kind of changing people's ideas of what it means to work in a brothel. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience and maybe what got you into it and, and then what you're doing now um, during the pandemic since um, obviously brothel work is not possible at the moment? Yeah, so I love sex work. I love all facets of sex work. I, you know, it does provide, I started dancing and then I got into adult and, you know, I did, you know, big features and did all this kind of stuff. And then I started doing clips and you were, just real quick, not to interrupt, but you were Wonder Woman mm-hmm. and you won a uh, best sex scene for that movie. And I actually, when I was looking for pictures of you, I came across you in the Wonder Woman outfit and you looked amazing. Like really. Thank you. I, I got into shape. Um, <laughs> Axel Braun said I was a little too chubby to be, I need to lose some weight. <laughs> so I, that's crazy. Doesn't yeah. sound like him. Oh, oh no, not at all. Um, so yeah. And it, I, I'm, I'm really proud of, of that role and you know and the wardrobe and everything that was that was really cool um yeah so I've done so much in all facets of work and I've done escorting um that was within the last like four or five years I wish I would have done it sooner um but again you know in adult it was looked down upon which is it's still insane to me um including myself I (laughs) I remember when I was like 22 years old or 23 or no, 21, 22. Um, I saw a friend, a mutual friend of ours. (laughs) I saw a friend on an escorting site and I called her and said, this site is using your photos. (gasps) Like, you know, like, yeah. Which does happen a lot. Yeah. She was fucking escorting. Like, but that was, it was, uh, it was really bad and really looked down upon, you know, this and that. And I came from that school, that school of like, <gasps> gas clutch pearls, clutch my mm-hmm. horror pearls. And, um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I just, I, I'm so sad. I missed out on all that money. I really am. But, uh, <laughs> but I did escorting. And then um, a couple years ago, like three, two and a half, three years ago, I don't know, fucking pandemic. Um, I was like, escorting for me was kind of an extra thing that I did. Like it would have to be, the stars would have to align, you know, kind of thing. And then I would do it, but I would have this money and I'd be like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like this money to me, this was my, my thoughts this is what went through my head that got me to the brothels. I thought to myself, can I deposit this? Can I, what can I pay with this? 
I like my, I can't show this income. How do I explain it? And these things, these thoughts, because my goal was home ownership. My goal was all these things, you know, living in LA, it, you know, home ownership for me was most people in LA can't afford to get into the market at uh, 700 grand, you know? So when I came up here, I was like, well, I want, I can buy a house. I could buy, you know, and I have this money and what the fuck am I supposed to do with it? So then I was like, well, how can I do this legally? Or is there a way that I can do this so I can have an LLC and make, do this job, do sex and work pay, and have and it be legal taxes. and pay the taxes on it and not get, not get in trouble. And like this, that. Look so, at you trying to pay your taxes. Oh yeah. I'm a big, I, I'm a big flag saluter over here. So, um, <laughs> so that's when I started researching the brothels and I was like, oh wow, this is like, this is a thing. I'll make the same amount of money. I could pop in there for a week, promote it, make good money, pay the taxes on it. And that seemed the easiest way for me to do um, kind of an escorting thing, right? So first I went to Sherry's Ranch, um, which is outside of Vegas. It's in Pahrump. And Sherry's is um, very nice. Like, I mean, like everyone has like a suite and like, I personally, like, I love the girls. I miss being on set around other sex workers. That is the hard thing about doing everything at home is that you you don't have that like bond with all these sex workers. And for me, going to Sherry's Ranch or going to the Bunny Ranch was a way for me to be around other sex workers. And it was great. And I've made some really great friends from working at the brothel industry, in the brothels. However, I think that the brothels are um, not up to date with um, how they uh, value the ladies. That's what they call them. We call the workers for the ladies. They, I feel that the 50, 50, like whatever you make there, they take half is ridiculous. Um, I, there is not a lot of incentive um, from management for girls to make, like make tier money like to like motive, there's not a lot of motivation. Um, I, I think that the brothel industry has a long way to go. And I'll tell you, I'll give you the perfect example. Um, on March 13th, 2020, I was at the bunny ranch and, uh, we were doing one of those house meetings. Like you remember on the TV show, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, what was their cat house? Uh, all the girl, the tea party. You remember? I've never watched the show, but okay, it's it's a good I've show. Been, I've been to rehab, so I know what house meetings are. Okay, like. so <laughs> so okay, so they have a house meeting, um, and basically it goes over. Uh, it's just like, what are we doing in the next few weeks? Like, what's going on in town? Like for outdates and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, what are a certain restaurant is offering the girls if they bring a date there because you can do out dates at Bunny Ranch. You, you get this discount or whatever, you know, but just an informative meeting, right? So March 13th, of course, you know, I'm freaking out because it's COVID. COVID, I mean, it was a day before lockdown, basically. And yeah, all, the, all the news was, this is going to hit us like a tidal wave. This is a big deal. And I started getting really paranoid because I didn't feel they were taking any precautions at all to keep us safe or whatever, because they didn't know anything. We all just Mm -hmm. didn't know anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I spoke up because my income does not, did not rely on them. Right. Mm -hmm. So I felt that a lot of the girls, ladies there, they couldn't say what I could say. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so I spoke up and I said, what are you doing to protect the ladies and the clientele? What am I supposed to tell somebody who wants to come here 
what are the protocols? What are, what are you doing? And the woman who was running the house meeting said, well, if you don't feel comfortable, you can leave. And I said, bye. (laughs) And well, first I said, well, am I going to be charged for leaving early? Because that is something that the brothels will do is you could technically be charged if you, for your house rent which is nothing yeah because um, i assume like you you book out a room or a suite for a certain amount of time yeah. and so that you leave early mm-hmm. they charge you for the days that you weren't there yeah and i wanted to question her in front of everyone so everyone was on the same page which was also very frustrating for them i think but um i said well are you going to charge me if i leave no anyone is anyone is allowed to leave if they don't feel comfortable right and so I was like, okay. And I went and I packed my shit and I fucking quit. Um, mm. The brothel industry has a long way to go, I think. I think Alice Little someday would make an amazing brothel owner. Mm. Um, they don't, they're not, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that really irritated me was, you know, the Bunny Ranch at these, um, meetings they were talking about how they advertised in some magazine and oh look in the in this in in exotica portland and i'm like are you fucking kidding me you have no <laughs> online you have nothing online you yeah. have no new articles since dennis died what are you doing online why am i giving you half of my money that yeah. that personality does not work in a brothel that is mm. Asking too many questions and being informed, it is not really welcome. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like they're kind of stuck in the they're dinosaur stuck. age. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah which, it's you know that you know that old you know agent thing or you know that vibe of the girls are this commodity mm-hmm. kind of thing, and you know, I don't like that. I can't, I I don't work in that environment. Um, Mm -hmm. so I mean, the, the, the future of the brothel industry is Alice Little. Yeah. And where she's going with it. She is amazing. And for those of you who haven't seen it, um, definitely go back and check out my interview with her because I did interview her, um, a couple months ago. It's, it's, I think one of my best episodes. She is so intelligent and really just like lays out everything about working in a brothel, the thing that she does, um, in a way that, you know, I, I, even I've never heard before and, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, she's, she's incredible. So I I agree. I think that she would do an amazing job. And, um, I mean, she pushes every day. Yeah, she is. And she pushes every day to improve the lives of brothel workers. She pushes as far as she can get um, with incentives and tier, tier stuff. She, every new girl that comes to the Bunny Ranch or their other uh, ranches that were right down the street, we call it the cul-de-sac. It was like a cul-de-sac of, of um, brothels basically across the street that they also owned, but who knows after she would do an intake with every single new girl. Now she's just, she didn't have to do that. Mm-hmm. And she would give her phone number to every new girl. And she would, if anyone had any questions, if they wanted to do drills on um, negotiations, you know, how to get what you feel is fair, you know, all this kind of stuff. I mean, she, she is the future of that industry for sure. Yeah. So what are you doing now? that you're not working at the bunny ranch. I am doing only fans. I am doing clips. What's stories. that? I've never heard of it. <laughs> no one's talking about that. Yeah. It's just new. <laughs> oh, and thank God for it. I, I, I feel that there are better platforms out there that, um, would suit the sex workers more, but you have to be where the fans are and the fans are at only fans. And, um, Thank God for it. Thank God for OnlyFans. What's the majority of content that you're creating on there? 
Um, well, I don't create exclusive, exclusive content for OnlyFans. I have a very big archive of content um, that I've shot over the years and I shoot all the time still. Um, I have been doing mainly um, domination stuff. I prefer it. Um, I think that it's a little bit more heady and you get to know somebody better when you're diving deep into their fetishes versus meat and potatoes porn, <laughs> With, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. just the meat and potatoes. Let's go. Let's pay the bills. Right. There's um, something very cerebral about, um, fetish work. Yeah. You know, I mean, it really taps into the human psychology in fascinating ways. Mm hmm yeah. So, um, that's mainly what I do. I mean, like I started training with Aiden star many years ago, um, for formal domination. Um, and I find that it works very well online as well, because a lot of people are too shy to show up at a brothel. A lot of people are too shy to show up to an appointment. A lot of people live in oh fucking Ohio. You know what I mean? Like, so to be available for phone, Skype, text, content, um, all those kinds of things and be available, be personable, be a customer service person, be their mommy, be their, you know, their strict dommy, you know, um, is great. And so that's what I've been doing. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's great. I, I just, I really can't wait to, um, for the vaccine though. I really can't wait to travel again and to feel safe. That would be real nice. Yeah. 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 I think all of us can't wait for life to get back to some semblance of normal. Mm -hmm. Well, Kimberly, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure to reconnect you with you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Since we were just, uh, talking about it, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you on OnlyFans and yeah. any other websites that you want to plug. Oh man. Um, OnlyFans.com slash Kimberly Kane. Um, people can go to canelinks.com where you will find a link where you, you could find my clip stores and all, like all kinds of information. Um, I am on Twitter. Who knows for how long they seem to be sweeping a lot of, uh, performers right now, but Kimberly Kane. I'm on Instagram, but I don't really care about it because they're such pieces of shit. Um, I am available and around and my, you know, um, uh, if you Google me, you will find me. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter while, while I'm still there as well. And if you want to support this podcast, of course, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered, where you can access all kinds of bonus content, such as this Q and a I'm going to do with Kimberly right after this, where my Patreon members ask me specific questions that she is going to answer for them. So thank you guys so much for watching or listening, whatever platform that you're on. Kimberly, thank you so much for coming on. It was great to see you again. All right, guys. See you next week. Bye. This episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Manscaped. Now we all love body hair on a man, but you still got to keep that under control. So in addition to Manscaped's Lawnmower 3.0, which is their revolutionary electric trimmer for your nuts, they will not nick or snag them. They have recently also come out with their Weed Whacker. This is an electric trimmer for your ears and your nose two other parts of your body that you definitely need to keep the hair under control. So go to manscaped.com, use code Holly and get 20% off plus free shipping.